How can God help us overcome anxiety? I want to talk about how the Christian or anyone for that matter can become a more stable, secure, stress-free human being in a world full of anxiety with so many things demanding our attention. The scriptures actually have a lot to say about this, but there's one overarching theme um, as to what's really taught. There's a certain life habit that scripture teaches is the ultimate stabilizer of our hearts that really enables us to walk in peace of mind and provides the sure death blow to anxiety. All right, Joey, enough. What is it? So the answer is cultivating a gospel-centered lifestyle of intimate friendship and surrender to God in prayer and study of scripture. Yes, that is definitely a mouthful, but where do I even get this and what does this look like? Well, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am a gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Practically speaking, this is actually a call to a vibrant prayer and Bible study life that focuses on receiving rest and experiencing the acceptance of Jesus. Our life consists of a steady diet of feasting on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this is represented in Matthew 4.4, 4, where Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, which he's actually quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. As unusual as it sounds, God has taught us that our happiness is found in being directed by the path of the scriptures. And that's said in Psalm 19.35, where it says, direct me in the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. The Apostle Paul explicitly calls out in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, that the key to battling anxiety is a gratitude filled, deep prayer life. And it says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. In Luke 10, 41 through 42, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen a good portion, which will not be taken away from her. He's saying the same thing to you and me today. Martha, Martha, you're anxious about many things, but one thing is needed, and that is sitting before Jesus, receiving his love and instruction. This isn't an exhaustive list of scriptures, but the point is that overcoming anxiety and walking in happiness is all about coming to Jesus to receive his rest through a steady diet of God's word and a serious lifestyle of gratitude filled prayer. To the degree in which we are in authentic connection with Jesus through his word is the degree in which we have access to living a stable mental life and being secure in our hearts. To neglect this spiritual lifestyle is to neglect our physical health. Now, I may be naive on many things, but I'm not naive to know that this doesn't mean we are anxiety-free 24-7 if we simply pray 24-7. This doesn't mean if we aren't in his word every day, we are bound for ruin. God is not a daily pill to take. There's no business transaction. The truth is our human frailty gets in the way. We tend to stray from this and our motivation ebbs and flows. Our time with God can feel empty and a waste of time. And that's okay. The Father accepts you just as you are, 100%. The Father doesn't accept you today because you did your quiet time or you read your Bible. He accepts you because of the work of Christ and you are truly a lovable person that he is interested in. For those who came to Jesus to receive rest and to surrender to him, we became blameless without accusation, approved by God and righteous before him. We don't need to add Bible reading uh, to that to stay approved. However, we need more life every day. And as we develop our connection with the Spirit of God, we grow into accessing more easily and consistently the presence and the voice of God through scripture that brings peace and rest. And 
We won't cave under the weight of the anxiety of this world. The further steps of searching scriptures produces untold riches in our hearts and lives. The Father gives us ordinary people, treasures in his word, no scholar can unearth. New and stronger human capacities are created in diligent study and prayer. The question then becomes, how do we get the most out of studying the Bible and praying in the secret place? I find myself being tired of having a stale, passive mindset when, it, when I spend time with God and his word. It's more than flipping open a random book. There's more available to us when we open our heart to be stirred by his spirit when meditating on the scriptures. So I've been on a mission and journey to uncover some of the most effective Bible study and personal prayer practices that early church heroes, Jewish rabbis, and monastic fathers have used to help them experience God in his word and have a healthy, enjoyable lifestyle of being led by the spirit through scripture. In episode one, I shared about George Mueller and being happy in God through praying the scriptures. And in episode two, we looked at early Jewish practices like Shavruta, Bekayut, Iyun, and Shuckling that has really helped me. And in this episode, I want to dive into some of the monastic traditions that deeply impacted ordinary believers to approach encountering the Father's love and hearing his voice through the scriptures. I just love talking about monastic traditions. My love for this began in middle school when my youth leader, shout out to Suds, started uh, a very laid back expression of a monastic tradition called monk school. No, it wasn't a cult. I didn't get a monk tonsure haircut where the top of my head was bald and no, I didn't wear a brown robe. It was a time of real community. He would bring, uh, a golden censer into his house like out of revelation and the incense would fill up his house with sweet fragrance we would talk about the scripture we'd have time in silent prayer together and we would even walk through his prayer labyrinth in his backyard and we ended the time with a barbecue where he would make the most on out of this world burger um, and this is where the seed of my love for church history began now, just so you all know, I'm not a Catholic or a hardcore fanboy of any one denomination or non-denominational denomination. I really just love Jesus and I love all his people uh, in the church. And I like to learn from others and I like to learn the history of people who love Jesus, regardless of the, per the, the Christian brand name. Okay, so that said, I want to share three monastic practices that I absolutely want more of in my life. They very much correlate with the Jewish practices of Shavruta, Iyun, um, and I that I talked about in my last video in episode two. The first one is called monastic spiritual directorship. To some, this just sounds like a fancy term for discipleship, but there's a really interesting difference between modern one-on-one -on -one evangelical discipleship and monastic spiritual directorship that I'll get into. But first, what in the world is this? So spiritual directorship is being guided by someone trained in these practices, whether a priest or a lay person focused on helping someone specifically grow and discerning God's presence and voice as that person shares and reflects on their own life. There are guiding exercises on the agenda of meeting with that spiritual director, and, but it's largely led by the person receiving the guidance and specifically in how God leads them. The relationship is steeped in mystical and co contemplative traditions of the early church fathers, not as an elite way to experience God, but as a relationship tool to simply help a person hear the voice of Jesus. This is different from one-on-one -on -one evangelical discipleship. Evangel evangelical discipleship tends to be more about biblical knowledge, practical application, mission-focused accountability, and follows a, more of a outlined discipleship curriculum. And again, don't get me wrong, this is absolutely necessary. I'm not saying to replace this form of di discipleship, but to seek to supplement it with monastic spiritual directorship as a vehicle for experiencing more emotional healing and receiving more love and affirmation from God, bringing us to a stronger place of rest and stability in this life. Spiritual directorship actually came from the desert fathers and mothers in the third and fourth centuries. And I 
I would imagine them to be like John the Baptist, eating locusts and dressed like a person experiencing homelessness. This group, uh, like John the Baptist, was early Christian hermits and monks who fled the cities to live in the deserts of Egypt to find solitude and devote themselves to enjoying God. I'm definitely not calling us to be hermits, although some may be called to a season of focusing on mental health, loving themselves better, and receiving peace from God as if they were a modern hermit. But in this instance, I'm more interested in their deep relationship with the Father and how we can learn from them. I want to encourage you all to do some of your own research on this and seek out someone to guide you through inner healing and learning to discern God's voice and presence in your life and in your current season. One of the features of spiritual directorship is called daily examine. The examine is a prayer and study practice developed by Saint Ignatius of Loyola, which is in Spain, and it include the concepts of consolation and desolation. This involved a series of rhythms to meditate on that looked at your day, either the day before if it's morning or the current day if you're praying at night. And it begins with becoming aware of God's presence near you and that his attention is really on you. Uh, you would then move into reviewing your day to identifying consolation and desolation. So what's consolation? Consolation is uh, moments you're thankful for that represents God's good goodness, moments of feeling peace, or moments you feel close to God. Um, my life, I call these sacred moments of God's goodness. And also reviewing your day in view of things from God's perspective. Desolation represents reviewing times where you felt distant from God, where you had episodes of anxiety or sadness or any spiritual dryness. And again, as you reflect on those moments, you would invite Jesus to give you his perspective and uncover areas of healing we need and to help us have more capacity to enjoy the good things in this life. This is a practice done individually and then brought to their spiritual director for discussion and prayer. All right, moving on. I can't mention spiritual directorship without mentioning Lectio Divina as the third monastic practice. I want to encourage us to explore. Lectio Divina means divine reading. It's similar to the close reading of Iyun in Judea Judaism, but has more of an emphasis on becoming aware of God's presence and hearing his voice. There are many versions of this, but generally it involves four main stages. The first stage is Lectio, which means reading. This is slow reading. It's taking the words and phrases of scripture and tuning into how they affect us with the awareness of the Holy Spirit being present to teach us. The second stage is Meditatio, which means meditation. And that's when reading scripture and there's a passage that stands out. This is where we enter into the scripture and see ourselves in the stories or sitting in deep thoughts or imagination on what the passage that stands out means to us in our circumstances. The third stage is oratio, which means prayer. And this is where we turn our feelings and thoughts and desires into prayer that the passage evokes. And the fourth stage is contemplatio, which means contemplation. And this is the final stage, and it's about becoming uh, open to God's voice in response to simply enjoying being in his presence and receiving his attention and love for us. There's an intentional nuance here, and that's why I love it. It's all about intimacy with the Father and, again, hearing his voice. A lot of people will use journals to process what's being read and write down uh, their prayers. When I hear his voice, that doesn't necessarily mean it's audible. It also doesn't necessarily mean God whispering English into our heads of a nice heartwarming sentence or two. God is spirit and he communicates differently than we humans communicate with humans. God speaks to our spirit and part of tuning into his voice is learning how he speaks to our spirit. Sometimes the interpretation into English or whatever language is flawed, but it's a process of hearing him and we do get better at discerning. These monastic practices along with Jewish study and prayer traditions and our examples of our early church heroes are just a drop in the bucket of how to get the most out of our time spent with God alone in prayer and study. So congratulations, you made it through my rambling. 
You have earned yourself a Listening to Joey Ramble badge. Wear it proudly. And as a reward, you get to like and subscribe to my channel. You are welcome. Be sure to check out my previous video on Jewish prayer and study practices. Until next time, everybody. Peace. You're watching Spirit and Life with Joey Meyer. Jesus said in John 6, 63 that his words are spirit and life. And this channel is dedicated to stirring up a passion for walking in the fullness of his spirit and sustaining an abundant life through his word.